Okay, yeah, so I'm Tracy. I'm going to talk to you about um, unbooked pregnancies based on a case I saw um, a couple of, couple of years ago now when I was um, working at St George's Munich. Um, so we see these kind of news reports um, all the time of um, babies that, um, that are born in places that, they, that are very unexpected. Uh, not the normal, um, not the normal kind of, um, not the normal kind of birth that we're used to attending, um, and they there are very very different outcomes. Um, so what do we do in these situations? Um, so I was called um, to review a baby. Um, the midwives called me to the postnatal ward. So we've got a baby who's just come in by ambulance, uh, came to Amy and got brought straight up here to the postnatal ward. Can you come and have a look at him? Um, this is an unbooked pregnancy, uh, so this mum received no antenatal care. She had an un unassisted home birth. Uh, cord wasn't clamped, but she's been told that the midwife has told the baby cried well at birth. Um, and mum has Graves' disease um, and is on uh, carbinazole and propanolol. Um, so I had never dealt with one of these cases before. So I had a lot of questions in my mind as I walked down the cor long corridor to go and review this baby. Um, handover from the paramedics was that baby had been born at two o'clock. Um, ambulance arrived at five minutes later. At class of ten, baby was was well and crying. They did a, a blood sugar straight away. It was two point one. Temperature was thirty six point six. And then when they repeated it um, in, on route, it had gone down to thirty four point eight. Um, heart rate one hundred and thirty. Rest fifty on arrival in UV. And the birth weight two point nine seven. Um, I spoke to mum about um, what was what had happened um, around, like initially, what happened around the time of birth. So she hadn't had any fevers. The rupture of membranes was only four hours in total. She delivered the baby herself in her bathroom straight onto towels. Baby cried pretty much straight away, um, and then she picked baby up. The cord snapped, and mum wrapped the baby in towels and called an ambulance. Um, so, so many questions I had. Uh, did the baby bleed out after the cord snapping? Uh, how can we assess the gestation of this baby? Mum didn't know that she was pregnant. So how, what, what is the gestation? What's the risk to the baby's um, thyroid status with mum having Graves' disease? What about the medication she was taking? Is there an infection risk? Is it okay for mum to even breastfeed? Uh, and what referrals do I need to make? So I'm going to go through and, and uh, go through these questions one by one. So first of all, kind of the most emergency thing, I guess, is did the baby bleed out when the cord snapped? Um, so initially, you, you just um, speak to mum. Uh, what did she see? Um, and she says there was no, not a, not a lot of blood seen. There wasn't blood on the floor or wrapped in the towel, just a tiny bit um, on the towel from where she wrapped baby up. So that is reassuring. Um, and then you've got your OBS chart. So your first thing you're going to see is tachycardia and this baby's OBS were lovely. Um, and then you've got your gas. So initially that first HB um, might be falsely reassuring. Um, you might not get a drop in HB straight away, but you'd, and at least, um, you would at least see um, a metabolic gastritis. And this baby's gas was very beautiful. Um, it didn't give me a lactate. Um, but, uh, Leading on from that is that sh that sugar as well. Um, from the uh, paramedics noted that the initial sugar was low, um, so they let they um, for one to put baby to the breast, and the sugars that we got um, were all normal. Um, so no acute hemorrhage. Baby uh, appeared to be uh, you know well initially. Um, so then, what gestation is this baby? Um, so what clues do we have as to that? So the weight's 2.97. So going on centile, if it was a 40 weaker, that would fit it between the 9th and 25th. And it was a 30, if it was a 36 weaker, it would be between the 75th and 91st centile. So um, that's reassuring that we're not dealing with, an, with a very preterm baby. Then other clues. So just ask mum, uh, she um, is likely to know the date of conception. Um, what was the first day of her last period, what her cycle is usually like. Um, and then you've got your typical parameters around birth with your scoring system, like the new Ballard score. So giving you your urine 
checking neuromuscular maturity, so posture, arm recoil, pop and feel angles, scar sign, heel to ear, and scoring that up with just what they look like. And then other things like how hairy it is, the sort of the feet, breast, eyes, um, the, the scrotum, and the clitoris. And you get scores for each of these things, and then add them all up, and that will help you to estimate the gestation. Um, then my third question about mum um, having Graves' disease. So um, these, uh, the, the risk is that um, there will be uh, passage through the placenta of the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin autoantibodies, which mum has, causing her own Graves' disease, which passes through the placenta and can cause uh, transient um, neonatal thyrotoxicosis in the baby. So that timing wise, that usually happens, if it's going to happen, it usually happens within the first one or two days, but it can be delayed, especially if mum is on antithyroid drugs, um, and it can be delayed up to six weeks. Um, if it does happen, it usually recovers within three to 12 weeks spontaneously as the mum's autoantibodies clear out of the baby's system. But if baby is very uh, symptomatic, um, then we treat with antithyroid drugs. Um, this is rare. Um, and this info is from um, the St. George's Handbook. Um, so what are the features of um, neonatal thyrotoxicosis? It's the same as growing up. So tachycardia, where it will be more than 160 at rest. Um, baby will be irritable, flushing. Um, over time, it won't gain weight, even though feeding is going well. There may be hypertension, it may have diarrhea, jaundice, goiter will be a late sign, and eye sign the late. Um, and if it's severe, then you'll have tachycardia um, and uh, arrhythmias, and eventually heart failure. So if the baby becomes symptomatic, you just start treatment. Um, you don't delay, you don't wait for the TFT, you just start treatment and speak to the, your local endocrine team, which will, who will advise you. And there are different drugs that you can use. Um, sometimes steroids are used. Um, and within 72 hours, um, you aim to get your baby to be clinically with thyroid or just have a minimal level of thyroid Um But your, um, your endocrine team will advise you if this were to happen um, and then follow up involves uh, monitoring head circumference and growth, uh, doing TFTs every two months uh, for the first year of life. Um, so the drugs mum was on, um, any mum that's unbooked, um, you need to you know, take a good history about what drugs they've taken and see um, if that can have affected the baby. So she was on carbinazole and propanol. So um, treating hyperthyroidism prevents serious complications in the baby, but it does cross the placental barrier and can cause harm. So things that have been reported are things like um, aplasia of cutis congenita, which is where you have a bit usually of your scalp um, that doesn't uh, grow hair. Um, if they can have craniofacial malformations, um, they can have defects in the abdo wall, like exomplos uh, or esophageal atresia, uh, and they can have VSDs. Um, propanolol can cause IUGR and neonatal hypoglycemia and bradycardia. So once you've done, once you've checked the side effects of each of your drugs and whether that can affect the baby, then you can go looking for any of these issues um, when you examine the baby. Um, next up was infection risk. Um, and specifically, um, I was wondering about HIV because this lady had not had any booking blood. Um, so um, I went uh, later and looked into um, what's our HIV prevalence here. So five years ago, our overall prevalence was 1.7 per thousand. Um, it's higher among men compared to women, where men are 3 per thousand, women 1.3 per thousand. And you see this dark purple areas is where there's a higher prevalence in the UK. So more than 5 per thousand in people aged 15 to 59 in uh, 17 London areas and in Manchester and in Brighton and Hope. So that's where, where the prevalence is highest in the UK. Um, we have universal screening now, antenatally of women for HIV. So um, more than 99% of women get screened um, at the start of their pregnancies. And in 2017, 
out of all of the women that were screened, there were 71 women um, that were confirmed HIV positive. So that was new diagnoses made, uh, which is 13 per 100,000 tests that are positive. So out of those 71 women, month about per year, if uh, HIV is diagnosed antenatally, then the risk MTCT is the mother to child uh, transmission rate. Um, by 2014, the risk of transmitting HIV to your baby when you've caught HIV early is 0.27%. Um, if it's postnatally diagnosed, so neither mum or baby are on treatment, there's about 20% chance of the child, child acquiring HIV from conception to, two, to the end of two years of breastfeeding. Um, if you're, um, and, and the sort of range um, on that, if you're not intervening, is between 15 and 45%. So at what point does that transmission occur? So you've got the whole of the pregnancy when that can occur, during labour and during breastfeeding. Um, so um, they think about 35% occurs during pregnancy, 65 during uh, pericarton, and uh, from breastfeeding varies between 7 and 22%. So in this mother, she'd already gone through her whole pregnancy um, and had given birth. So if she did have HIV, the risk would be, um, most of the risk has already happened. Um, and uh, the risk of, breast, of, of uh, passing it on through breastfeeding is up to 20%. Um, we knew that we could get a rapid HIV screen done within a few hours. Um, so she would be having two or three breastfeeds within that time. So most um, from the most people I spoke to, most units um, allow breastfeeding, uh, encourage breastfeeding in these cases, um, because the, the, the most of the risk has already happened, and the risk from two or three breastfeeds in our population is minimal. So yes, she can breastfeed. So plan for this baby. Um, was that we would monitor the blood sugars for 24 hours because of the propanolol um, and her sugars were fine. We did the OBS for two days looking for any signs of, of thyroid disease, um, noting that it could go either way um, and there were no signs in this baby. We traced the virology which was all negative and um, we made referrals. So the referrals we made were to endocrinology so that this mum can be followed up um, and um, paying special attention to baby and just letting mum know what are the signs to look out for in baby um, for which she would seek uh, extra, extra review. Um, breastfeeding support, um, she did want to breastfeed but hadn't, you know, wasn't expecting to be giving birth so um, she needed extra support with that. Um, if there were any concerns about temperature instability or the odds going off, we would have had a low threshold for giving antibiotics that this baby was fine. And then a discharge planning meeting just to check in with uh, social issues. Um, so these are the three um, things we did. Um, so we obviously involved the consultants because it's an unusual case. Um, baby had a normal night and safeguarding were happy that baby was um, fit for discharge. So the story in this mom was that she had just got her diagnosis of um, Graves disease when she uh, um, became pregnant and she didn't know, she had unprotected sex, didn't know that she had conceived the baby. Uh, she, she was having a lot of symptoms from her thyroid, including bloating. Um, she was having lots of um, um, palpitations. She had severe exothalamus. So while she was being followed up, started on treatment for her graves and followed up by the endocrine team, she had noticed that she, her belly was getting bigger. She put it down to bloating and she was getting tummy pains. And things were changing in her body, but she was, um, when she mentioned these soft signs, she was reassured that these could be all uh, to do with the treatment that she was on. So she she just um, just kind of dismissed it um, and didn't think that she she was having some spotting as well, um, which she had had a regular period in the past. So she didn't know that she was pregnant until the morning that she gave birth on the bathroom floor in her parents' house, um, and her parents that she lived she, she was in. Her early 20s, her parents were just as surprised. They didn't, they hadn't noticed any signs in her um, that she had been pregnant. Um, so um, my last little section is about these sorts of pregnancies. So 
Um, you have concealed pregnancies and denied pregnancies. So concealed is where uh, a woman will hide that she's pregnant um, and doesn't want to tell anyone for whatever reason. And then denial, being in denial can be conscious or unconscious. Um, and um, unconscious denial where, um, there are, where the woman is completely unaware that she is pregnant. So there are things her body is changing, but she's unaware for whatever for whatever reason, but just pay attention to these words and kind of the judgment that comes up when these cases come up. So a woman can be unaware, she can be feeling or denying for whatever reason, but often our language used is quite judgmental. So just be aware of your, um, your kind of bias and about the words, the words that we use around these cases. Um, Unbooked pregnancies um, in the literature, so in Galway, they uh, came up with a prevalence of one in 148 births, which is quite high. Um, in a study in Berlin, they said the incidence at 20 weeks was one in 475, but still being denied to the point of delivery, so that the woman delivers without having realized she's pregnant, is one in 2,400. And uh, in South Wales, they came up with a similar number when they did a uh, population-based study over 11 years. Um, where the incidence was 1,000, 1 in 2,000 deliveries. Um, so what do they miss out on, these pregnancies and um, these babies? So antenatally, I mean, they miss out on so much. So, you know, the folic acid, the alcohol smoking cessation, having mum's medication looked at and avoiding to antigens, blood pressure monitoring, blood glucose monitoring, uh, all of the scans, and then within labour, all of the monitoring that happens there and prevention of complications and postnatally you know there's no nls trained staff present at that delivery the people around the mum may not know how to manage the cord as in this mum they don't know how to deliver the placenta or avoid a pph they don't know how to keep baby warm or how important that is and then help with breastfeeding in the first two hours often doesn't happen um, so we do all of the medical things as pediatricians, but um, bear in mind the impact on attachment and bonding. So they're at risk of uh, poor attachment because uh, mum is not um, expecting this baby to be born. Uh, there may be a lack of willingness or a lack of ability to think about baby's needs. Um, they might not adapt to their new situation. They might abandon the baby in the worst case scenario, which does happen if you uh, Being aware of the risk that these things will help us to support um, the mum and avoid these things from happening. So there's a controversial um, group um, called uh, the Association for the Improvement of Midwifery Services. They have a helpline um, which they advertise for pregnant women to call if they have concerns about their pregnancy. And in 2020, they noticed they were getting a lot more calls um, from women who, because of COVID, weren't being allowed to have a home birth or weren't being given access to a birth center. So they were, because of that, they were considering free birthing. So, and they wanted some advice about it. So free birthing is when a woman intentionally gives birth to her baby without a midwife or doctor there. And that's not the same as giving birth at home before healthcare professional arrives. That's BBA or before arrival. In the UK, it's legal to free birth and legal to decline antenatal care. Women can't be forced to have anyone present at the birth or to undergo medical intervention, and they don't have to justify their decisions to anybody. So, in UK law, uh, unborn children don't have any rights, so the fetus has no separate rights from its mother. Um, but if once a baby's born, if they're harmed or injured or abandoned, that's when police and social care need to get involved. Um, and the case law came from 1997 in this Butler Schoss case, which uh, where the, the law was set out that women can refuse medical intervention whilst pregnant, including antenatal and perinatal care. And that can be for religious reasons, for other reasons, for rational reasons, or irrational reasons, or for no reason at all. They don't have to give their reason, they're just allowed to refuse. The exception, of course, is where the woman lacks capacity, as described by the mental capacity act. Um, so when someone has an unassisted birth with nobody there, the parents must still notify the birth because it was different to registering the baby and that notification has to happen within 36 hours. They have to get an NHS number for the baby and then they have to register it within 42 days. So when you're in hospital, this happens automatically. 
um, or when you have a, a home birth with a midwife. But if you're free birthing um, and um, doing it without medical help, then this needs to this still needs to be done. Then a referral to children's services happen when uh, there are concerns about the well-being of the baby after it's born, uh, not just because mums have declined to care about labour. Um, so um, woman, the woman's right to bodily integrity and autonomy is protected by Article 8 of the Human Rights Act. And it can't be overruled because we're worried about an unborn baby, because the baby doesn't have rights until it's born. So after it's born, that is going to be. Um, so I made a little flow chart because most units just have um, uh, in, their, in their guidelines a little line about uh, checking on looking blood. But I wanted something to kind of um, something to follow for whenever this comes through, um, if they were swear to come through again. So um, when, when babies are born and mum hasn't been worked up antenatally, send your urgent biology. Yes, let them breastfeed whilst you're awaiting that rapid result. Take detailed history from mum about her medication, her drugs and her diagnoses. Is there any increased risk of congenital malformation? And if so, do a thorough examination of baby. And then think about referring to perinatal mental health and social services and observe closely. Um, and our baby was absolutely fine and went home with mum. So any questions? If not, I'll hand over back to the team. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Becky Lee, who is currently working at King's uh, in neonatology. Um, over to you. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Emma. Um, so, yeah, I'm Becky. I'm one of the um, neonatal grid trainees, currently a research fellow at King's. Um, and thanks for that, Tracy. It's a really comprehensive um, overview of approach to an unbooked pregnancy. So, that is also what I prepared. So not wanting to do too much repetition. Um, let me just uh, um, see if I can share my screen. Sorry. Give me two seconds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've been having tech problems all morning. And oh, no, I, I think, think I've just made you a presenter. See if it will let you. Here we go. It's the uh, accessibility. I need to let go to your meeting to go. It did the same for me this morning. <laughs> I should be a pro at this. I've had to do it so many times already today. Yeah. <laughs> the Zoom age. <laughs> so every time someone uh, uses a different modality, uh, let me try one more time. Yeah, it's just kicking me out each time I go to share oh, my no. screen. Do you want to maybe um, send them to me in a quick email and I can do the slides for you if you like? 
Yeah, she would do that. Yeah. Um, that is sometimes the easiest way in the end. <laughs> it's just on sarah.surrogate.nhs.net that I can do. Yeah, hang on. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions for Tracy, do let us know. Uh, I had a question, uh, Tracy. Just um, in your experience, or open to the the floor to anyone that um, uh, is in the meeting. Um, how often have you sort of come across this? I know you presented one case, but how um, how frequently have you been called to delivery or come across a case of uh, unbooked pregnancy? I think for me it was only that one, and then I was super prepared after doing this presentation to see another one, and uh, it's never come up again. <laughs> I think I've had one, no, maybe two actually, and they were both. Um, we had a couple during COVID actually, where I think it was maybe a little bit more difficult for women to get access to antenatal care, or people weren't, you know, wanting to go and see the doctor, etc. So we definitely had a couple of cases of um, more sort of deliberately unbooked compared to not realising, which I think is quite a different thing, isn't it? Quite a different I've definitely had that. I've definitely had maybe three, if not four. Um they were relatively sadly common within Croydon. Yeah. Um, I found Um, I'm going to try one more time to send you these slides. I'm having loads of issues from the research office. I should have anticipated this given how my meetings this morning went. <laughs> That's all right, don't worry. <laughs> You know what, should we just do it without slides because everything's crashing yeah, sure, now so fine. for fear of yeah. being kicked out of this meeting no no that's fine we can, we can do it more interacting again <laughs> um uh so yeah so just um yeah we're well, very much building upon um uh, tracy's very comprehensive run through of everything that she reflected upon uh after her case of uh, unbooked pregnancy um i also um have found sort of a more useful in these scenarios. So uh, the reason I was asking how um, how frequently you might have come across this is that I've actually, I think I've seen quite a few of these and it might just be more telling of um, my age um, and uh, sort of how many years out of training I've had. So how, how long I've been a trainee. Um, so actually I've, I've now been to, I've been involved in quite a few cases where there would be an unbooked pregnancy due to any number of variety of reasons. Um, so I thought it would be useful to run through, um, to run through those. So um, what I thought in a, a structured approach uh, was four key things really. Um, and I'll happily share my slides. Um, I'll send them to Sarah later so she can share them out. Um, but what I thought was important in court four key areas when you're asked to um, be involved in one of these situations um, was number one, to always sort of think through your risk assessment. Uh, number two is to prepare yourself for the delivery and for the baby um, as the neonatal team. Uh, three would be undertaking the postnatal assessment and four would be safeguarding. Um, and as we sort of just discussed, there could be a variety of reasons why um, a pregnancy is unbooked, whether it is um, an undetected pregnancy, so the case where a woman or her carers are unaware, or any number of um, uh, types, we should say, of concealment, which I agree are all quite judgmental in the way that they're termed. So whether it's a conscious concealment where the woman's aware of her pregnancy, um, but it's not told anyone or, or presented to services, 
um, conscious denial where she is unaware of um, her physical symptoms. Um, uh, oh, so sorry, sorry, is aware that she has physical symptoms but hasn't created that attachment to pregnancy and so not accepted and um, the pregnancy is, um, is happening and ongoing. And, and the situation with an unconscious denial where she doesn't believe in her symptoms or the pregnancy um, even after um, the birth of a baby, which is generally um, much more affiliated with sort of significant mental health problems. Um, and, and very rarely the case. Um, so there are many reasons why um, women may conceal their pregnancy and as um, the neonatal SHO or Reg or the neonatologist um, involved in their care, often we can get really bogged down with um, uh, the baby and thinking about what do we need to do for the baby? What's the process? What do we need to tick box? And um, what's on our flow sheet of what we need to do to the baby? Um, whereas I always think actually, we do have a significant roles in families. Um, we are increasingly um, moving towards centralising family um, family care, and sort of having an understanding of um, why these things happen. So, what has happened to this mother? Why has she concealed this pregnancy? Um, and there are significant risk factors there that will influence what we do going forward if we just stop and actually think, what what is going on? You know. Is this an unwanted pregnancy? Is there um, a situation of domestic abuse or, or previous social service involvements and so fear of removal of another child from a family? This creates significant heightened risks of um, ongoing care provided for this child, even not in even if it's not just in the um, uh, the immediate term when they're born. Or is there a background of significant substance misuse or significant mental health problems of where there is an acute concern of potential um, exposure of this baby? Is there um, additional safeguarding concerns? Is, have these women um, been trafficked? Are they, is there a significant language barrier? Are they being denied care? Are they in controlling relationships? Um, or is there an ever-increasing, as we've seen, um, desire for an, a natural pregnancy or to avoid medical intervention, which um, although has a movement in itself and is being termed free birthing, I think it should be approached in a very similar way. If we are respectful and considerate and we try to understand why women make these decisions that they do, um, we should be treating all women fairly. And just because a woman who is often of a more educated background and is making a conscious decision to free birth and deny antenatal care, the risk assessment um, for the baby remains the same, and we should um, we should bear that in mind. Um, that just because they have a name attached to it and other professionals who may support their choices, um, that um, that their baby should be treated any differently to any other baby um, who's born to a mother who hasn't booked her pregnancy. Um, the reason why this matters is that um, the as we said, the reason behind it is going to be a key factor in determining the risk to this mother and baby. Um, and the Embrace report has identified that um, women who book late or unbooked are a much significant greater risk of maternal and fetal complications. And actually, one of the most recent PMRTs, so the, um, the perinatal mortality review tools, they are publishing annually their um, outcomes of their reports, although there's quite a fair delay. I think it's uh, it's okay to say in due to COVID, but um, the PMRT reviews are increasingly identified that late booking or unbooking of pregnancy is factored in a significant number of um, on over reviews that have then been referred for the PMRT process. So I think in the 2019-2020 review, um, an unbooked or late booking pregnancy factored in the um, sad out, sadly poor outcome of 220 babies. That was 15% of reviews. It was a key factor in the outcome. Um, as we discussed, there are lots of consequences for babies as a result of not being booked. They're at greater risk of being born free term or low birth weight. There is significantly greater risk of interuterine death and of stillbirth. And there's also interesting data. It, a lot of the data about um, unbooked pregnancies is coming from um, middle or low income countries. It's quite a rare occurrence in the UK. Um, however, in 
countries where they're um, where they are seeing significant numbers due to additional socioeconomic barriers to accessing medical care um, and unbooked pregnancy um, or presenting in labour for your first antenatal care is significantly associated with neonatal morbidity um, admission to a neonatal intensive care unit and increased incidence of HIE um, so they should all be things to consider additional consequences uh, of babies who have been significantly exposed to substances so in the immediate term whether they are at risk of neonatal withdrawal um, or display features of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders um, through ongoing childhood um, uh, and they're at risk of the consequences um, that we see emotionally and in child mental health of um, from poor attachment um, and being born in um, environments where there's poor parental resources um, and preparation for, for raising a child. So these are, like I said, not just um, in the immediate term for the baby, but I think as paediatricians having a broader mind to the challenges these children are going to face um, through their lives. Um, so that was uh, considering our risk assessment um, and I think what is key thereafter is um, for us to think about how we prepare as medical professionals. So the classic bleep, um, unfortunately you can't see on my slides but I've written two that I can recall um, recently, so these were bleeps that would have gone to my SHO always overnight. Um, you were very fortunate Tracy that yours uh, happened at two o'clock in the afternoon and uh, this is inevitably uh, a situation that will only arise at three o'clock in the morning um, when the resident consultant or the registrar has gone on their break uh, and you'll get a call from the midwife saying hi um, we need you to come to room seven urgently this lady's just walked in labour she's not booked here she doesn't have any notes and I don't think she speaks any English um, so that is a classic um, but most recently that I had a very similar story, the SHA told me you need to come to the room urgently. This woman walked in in labour. She was having a free birth, but she's been in labour for four days. She hasn't been to any appointments. The baby's being delivered. Um, so that uh, will quite rightly instill fear in many people. But having a structured approach to, the, uh, to your preparation in that situation um, should help you manage many of the sort of impending outcomes. So the key to know is, is this delivery imminent? Do you have time to uh, get your team? Do you need to go to the room immediately and call for additional help from there? Um, you, have you got time to even ask questions? Have the midwives measured the fundal height? They identified the presentation of this baby. Has an obstetrician been able to do an urgent bedside ultrasound scan to just give you an idea? Is this a significantly preterm infant? Is this looking like a term baby? Is it undiagnosed be breach, obstruct, um, unobstructed labour? Is there more to consider here? Um, this, in this situation, a continuous CTG is absolutely indicated. So are there any CTG concerns? Um, and really breaking down those barriers of um, the paediatrician being stood at the back of the room waiting for the baby whilst the obstetricians and the midwives do their bit. Um, in, if, in many situations, but certainly in these situations, um, we're key to the team and, and sharing of this information is absolutely critical for us to prepare um, how we can safely manage these babies. Um, as part of preparation, um, asking about the maternal bloods, have they um, been sent? We'll come on to those uh, shortly after and then gathering of neonatal staff and equipment. And the preparation would take uh, the form of, of any um, uh, delivery that we're called to from an NLS perspective. So considering airway breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. So if you are attending the delivery of an unknown gestation, unknown um, antenatal care, unbooked um, mother, you are going to go with uh, multiple masks and airway devices. You're going to go with a team that's an appropriate, um, of appropriate experience to be able to manage the situation. You're gonna have your equipment and ensure your NICU um, is aware with staffing and cot space available. You're going to have um, an ability for a rapid circulation assessment, including pre and post ductal sats. And you're going to go with a high index of suspicion for this infant to be exposed to drugs, toxins, or as I said, I have a high risk of HIE. Um, and we're going to go with a very um, open mind of, um, of the exposure to this infant. So from a perspective of an undiagnosed congenital anomaly and the potential exposure of um, abnormal maternal serology. 
although the incidences um, of um, significant maternal morbidity in the terms of transmittable serology such as HIV and hepatitis B or even congenital syphilis are exceptionally low in London. Um, the risk population who are likely to present in these situations would fall into a higher risk category for many of these um, um, serological diagnoses and so um, the index of suspicion is always raised until you've had confirmation from maternal bloods that these results are negative. In the situations I've been in before um, I have come in to take handover from a baby that was unbooked and born overnight um, and no urgent bloods have been sent on the mother because it was the weekend the midwives thought it could wait till Monday and unfortunately none of the neonatal staff dared challenge them on that. Um, however, I've been in the situation where um, in the middle of the night, an on-call consultant, microbiologist and virologist was very happy to take this phone call and do the risk assessment on the phone and authorised urgent testing, certainly of HIV, which we got a result back within an hour. We know that we need a HIV result back um, within four hours of birth. Um, and there, I don't believe there would be any um, micro or virology department who would challenge that in an unbooked pregnancy, even when the risks are low, at least to do a rapid HIV test, I think is a very reasonable request. Um, additionally, um, having our hepatitis B serology, it just allows um, timely immunisation or, or further intervention um, in accordance with national guidance. So I personally don't think, and in my experience, um, having dealt with virologists and microbiologists out of hours, they're very amenable to this. So requesting that the bloods are sent urgently um, and processed urgently generally gets a good um, outcome. So don't be um, necessarily uh, reassured by someone saying it can happen on Monday. We can take some responsibility. Um, an interesting um, challenge I've come across in a case similar um, was where a mother had refused testing so she denied um, she refused uh, consent for testing for herself and so um, thankfully in daytime hours we were able to have a multidisciplinary discussion about the risk assessment for the baby um, and um, were able to um, to uh, eventually with the support of legal services um, do the investigations on the baby in view of their best interests um, with a significant uh, risk factor and social history that supported that this child was at risk. Um, so don't, uh, what I would say is, is trust your instinct and if you necessarily don't think a safe decision has been made, um, escalate to your consultants or escalate um, to any safeguarding lead because um, invariably our instincts are rarely wrong. Um, so moving on from uh, our risk assessment, so preparing why this woman has presented with an unbooked pregnancy and preparation, thinking about all the things that could possibly go wrong, uh, which could be anything, um, which inevitably won't happen because these babies are often born absolutely beautiful, um, but uh, being prepared for any outcome. We then move on to our postnatal assessment. Um, and as um, Tracy's already covered, um, the important things to consider here are a gestational age assessment. Um, doing a NIP, uh, or what we term here a NIP plus, so a NIP with an, uh, an extended look at everything, so not just your standard newborn physical examination, you're delving into the details of absolutely everything. You're doing your pre and post septal sats, you're actively looking for problems, you're putting your baby on observations, you're doing BM monitoring, and you're considering every possible risk factor that you don't already know about or that hasn't arisen in the history taking to date to ensure the safety and safe management of this baby. Um, we always feel that there is a, in this particular instance, there is um, a, a good reason to have a low threshold for a period of NICU observation and or intervention, particularly if there's concerns about the gestational age, uh, an immature or low birth weight infant, um, or any abnormal physical signs, which you ordinarily, through a antenatally cared for pregnancy might be safely managed on the postnatal ward. Um, although separating mums and babies is never ideal, um, there would certainly be a good indication for a heightened level of risk um, and a period of observation for these infants. 
Um, regarding a gestational age assessment tool, um, there are there are two uh, available. Um, one's slightly more extensive than the other. There's a Dubowitz examination, which is the um, sort of classical examination looking at 12 physical and 10 neuromuscular examination findings. Um, but this is only validated for gestational ages between 26 and 44 weeks. Um, however, it has been noted in meta-analyses that it is the most accurate and 95% um, of pregnancies can be dated using this tool um, within 2.6 weeks of a dating-based ultrasound scan. Um, the second is called a Ballard score or the new Ballard score, which I believe was the um, images that Tracy showed on her slides. Um, and this is a simplified version and it uses 12 physical or neuromuscular signs but the new Ballard score has been validated for use to um, establish gestation from 22 weeks. Um, so that does provide um, additional reassurance in the case of extreme prematurity. Um, it's been found in meta-analyses that the Ballard method um, in 95% of pregnancies, it can date within, with accuracy to within 3.8 weeks of an ultrasound dating scan. So not as ideal, that's kind of a month. So you, can, you have a month it's leeway either way. Um, so I think the take home point is the gestational age assessment tools can be can be used and they're helpful, but with uh, uh, varying degrees of um, leeway either side. And then lastly, um, moving on to safeguarding. Um, so I think it's really important in our role that we are um, safeguarding infants, but also recognising our role in safeguarding families. And as paediatricians, we're all also required to do our adult level two safeguarding. Um, and so um, having uh, concerns, having risks um, identified, disclosed to us, um, are, are sort of general occurrences. And it may be that we, um, are having disclosures from these uh, from a mother that uh, the midwifery staff are not aware of, um, or it may be that we are observing behaviours or interactions that um, heighten our risk, which um, may not have been picked up otherwise. So safeguarding, as we all know, is everyone's responsibility um, and it's everyone's job. And even though we are involved in the care of the child, we should also be mindful of our responsibility for the care of these families. Um, so out of hours, um, the safeguarding would be um, ordinarily coordinated by the band seven on delivery suite. And um, so just to give you a clear idea of who should be taking responsibility. Um, the notification of an unbooked delivery um, is always made to the midwife, uh, the named midwife for safeguarding. Um, and there's um, often a case where um, the children's social services will be notified because they're in a strong position to um, be aware if this mother or child or unborn baby is um, noticed to a missing person alert if they've absconded from another local area. Um, often these um, safeguarding assessments can be made very rapidly within a day or so, um, depending upon the reason as to why the mother is unbooked or concealed her pregnancy. Um, we will know very quickly how heightened our risk is. But unfortunately, we are in this difficult position where um, neither mums or babies should be discharged, um, especially overnight, until there's been a safe ongoing agreed plan of care with the involvement of children's social services. Um, if it is felt that this um, was an unexpected, unanticipated incident and there is no ongoing risks, um, the children, uh, the babies are often discharged home with their mothers within a day or so um, with a heightened support uh, provided by their um, community midwifery team. Um, but the important thing is to not make um, women feel that they are being judged or persecuted. It is to provide the safety or ensure the safety of all babies um, and that all mothers are, present, uh, um, are um, supported in the community and that these babies don't come to additional harm. Um, so what I will do is send these slides to Sarah so she can distribute them on. There's just a structured approach, as I said, four key areas of risk assessment, preparation, postnatal assessment and safeguarding, um, and an overview of the tools to assess gestation. And I think for, um, I would say, not just for the level of an SHO, for the level of a senior registrar or even the resident consultant, um, when we're the neonatologists in these situations, covering these key areas 
are going to ensure the safety of mums and babies and ensure that medical care of infants is appropriate and meeting their needs. Um, and it provides a nice, um, a nice structured approach for which you can base any further reading or reflections for your um, portfolio. Because I know not everyone will come across these scenarios, um, but they are great because they cover not only infant care, family-centered care, and also safeguarding situations. So these are really great cases. Even if you haven't seen, um, you can still reflect upon um, this teaching and link to plenty of domains that you may struggle with on your portfolio. Um, so it's a, a really useful topic. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for me, I can only apologize again about my uh, tech issues from the research office. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, um, fire them through in the chat or um, shout them out and I'll send my slides to Sarah shortly. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, if you've got any questions, you can either shout them out now or pop them in the chat. We do, as is tradition, have a quick uh, five question quiz to finish out the session. Um, so if you'd like to go to kahoots.it, that's K-A-H-O-O-T.it, you can do it on your smartphone. Um, you don't need to download the app and just pop in the game pin. Um, you can give yourself a nickname. We tend to find that people often enjoy the quiz more if they're anonymous. Um, so given the theme of today, you can put in the name of your favorite neonatal medication. Um, I can see that there's a team on from the Whittington. You can do it individually if you like, or you can all play together. Um, and then once we get some people on the game, we will start just five questions to see what you've learned today. Classic secret is there already. Um, <laughs> free serve. Any neonatal word will do, um, just so that you know you can claim the glory of winning. Um, if you've not played Kahoot before, you get points for getting the right answer. You also get points for getting the right answer the fastest. Um, so answer as quickly as you can. It's good training for those MCQ exams where you have like thousands and thousands of questions to answer and not very long to answer them in. Um, we'll give it another 10 seconds to see who else is going to come and play. Um, before we start the quiz, but you can all get back to the ward afterwards. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so five questions, and we will see who triumphs at the end. So the first question is coming up. So which screening tests should you do for someone like in Tracy's case, she just presents in labour, walks onto the ward. Um, as Becky was saying, you get those bleeps in the middle of the night. Which screening test should definitely, definitely be done for these women? Very good. You all got it right. Absolutely. It's HIV because obviously it's so important that you get the antiretroviral medication started as soon as possible if they are HIV positive. So very good, surfactant is in the lead. Um, second question is coming up now. So which term would you use to describe a pregnancy where the person who is pregnant is either unaware or unable to accept the fact that they're pregnant? So both Becky and Tracy talked a bit about terminology and which is the correct terminology to use. So interesting, um, the concealed pregnancy is usually used to refer to someone who knows that they're pregnant, um, but has decided for whatever reason not to tell anyone, not to access any services. A denied pregnancy is what we sometimes use to refer to women who either can't accept that they're pregnant or in some cases just completely unaware that they're pregnant as well. So very similar terms, similar situations, but different terminology. And if you're the paediatrician and you're looking after a baby in one of these cases, so either mum's concealed the pregnancy or she didn't know that she was pregnant, who do you need to contact? And which of, which of these would really be your responsibility as a paediatrician to make sure that they're involved? Um, 
yeah absolutely social care so remember your responsibility is primarily to that baby so that's the most important person that you contact because as we said even if the mum's just been completely unaware that she's pregnant that's going to be a huge huge shift in her life and a huge shift in her caring responsibility it's really important to make sure that there's all the proper support in place okay so the fact is still in the lead very close for second place two more questions to go um, which of the following would you not use to treat neonatal thyrotoxicosis? This is from Tracy's presentation. Um, a little bit of endocrinology thrown in there. She mentioned three drugs that you might use to treat a case of neonatal thyrotoxicosis. Which one of these was not in there? Yeah, very good. So hydrocortisone wasn't in there. All of the other ones you might use, some of them in combination. And just for the last question, okay, so ichthyosis is on top. Still very, very close at the bottom though. Um, so let's see who's going to triumph. And then finally, which of these scoring systems could you use to estimate the gestational age of a baby who's been unbooked? So where you don't know, for example, when the last menstrual period was, or you haven't had a dating ultrasound score, which of these could you use? Yes, very good. We all got that correct. Excellent. So there's the Ballard score. That's just one of them. There are other scores available, um, but that's kind of one of the simplest ones to use. And so that's the one that certainly interests where I've worked. So that's the one that we've used. So very good. It looks like everyone managed to get something out of this session, which is fantastic. So adrenaline was third. The faction came in at number two. Um, and top was very well done to whoever was ichthyosis um so thanks everyone so much for logging in and thank you to tracy and becky in particular for really really thought-provoking presentations um on unbooked pregnancies certainly a situation that i think we'll all come across at some stage 